Well, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be. And also to those on live stream, thank you for being here today. Um, I'm not exactly sure what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, uh, I haven't heard uh, from Jacob or anybody as to who's teaching. I may be teaching, I'm not sure, but we'll see what happens. Um, just show up and you'll get a <laughs> you'll get a surprise either way. Um, and thanks for your prayers. Uh, both Jacob and Dan are out of, out of the, they're still in the hospital, but they're recovering now. And I assume both of them, it's going to take them a while to recover from the anesthetic. That's, that's what really throws you for a, a loop. I mean, of course there's pain, but uh, you know, just pray for them that they, they will be able to recover quickly. Okay, well, today we're uh, continuing on in our study in Philippians. We're in Philippians 2, 12 through 18. There's a little story from uh, uh, Our Daily Bread that went like this. When a person becomes a Christian, he usually undergoes some radical life changes, especially if he's had an immoral background. Through the first steps of spiritual growth and self-denial, he gets rid of the large obvious sins, but sad to say many believers stop there. They don't go on to eliminate the little sins that clutter up the landscape of their lives. Gordon MacDonald in his book, uh, Ordering Your Private World, told of an experience in his own life that illustrates this truth. Some years ago, when Gail and I bought the old abandoned New Hampshire farm we now call Peace Ledge, we found the site where we wished to build our country home strewn with rocks and boulders. It was gonna take a lot of hard work to clear it all out. First phase of the clearing process was relatively easy. The big boulders went fast. And when they were gone, we began to see that there were a lot of smaller rocks that had to go too. But when we cleared the site of boulders and rocks, we noticed all the stones and pebbles we hadn't seen before. This was much harder, more tedious work. But we stuck to it, and there came a day when the soil was ready for planting grass. Well, that kind of illustrates what we're, uh, what Paul's talking about in today's lesson starting in verse 12. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. We see from these verses that sanctification of the believer is a two-way process. God works on us, that's Philippians 2.13 and 1 Corinthians 12.6. And if we respond and learn our lessons, then we grow. If we don't respond, then we can shrink back, Hebrews 10.39, wander away, James 5.19, and finally fall away, Luke 8.13 and Hebrews 6.6, and be destroyed. Uh, uh, first, Second Timothy two eighteen and Hebrews ten thirty nine. That's why in those two verses we just read, we find the work of the Christian and the work of the Lord both mentioned with regards to sanctification. So, what does the word sanctification, which is hagiazo, mean in First Corinthians six eleven, where justification and sanctification are both mentioned? Well, it means to separate from profane things, sin sinful things, and to get it dedicate to God, to purify. God wants to separate and purify us, but we must be willing to work out our salvation. Now, that doesn't mean that we can justify ourselves with God. We cannot save ourselves with our works. That's not what Paul's saying. He's saying we need to obey the Lord or else we will can be judged. Why did Paul say with fear and trembling? 
First uh, Peter two seventeen, show proper respect to everyone, love the brotherhood of believers, fear God, honor the king. We must always realize that God is the judge. He can save us. He can sanctify us. But if we have no healthy fear of judgment and wander away, he can also end up judging us. We must not only believe in Jesus Christ to be saved, but as I've said before, the word for believe in many places is pisteo, which means to commit. Commit. We must believe, but also live out our faith by obeying God. Remember what John said many times. John 14, 23 through 24. Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the father who sent me. You know, we prove we love him, that we pisteo him, that we've committed to him by obeying him this is why we, this is how we must work out our salvation the work of faith is not the same as working for your salvation works is talking about things we do in order to try to justify ourselves with the father but that does nothing that doesn't work but we must work out our faith show our faith in works as james says in order to prove we really love the Lord. That's not a work. It's a tangible evidence of belief and commitment to Christ. This kind of work evidence itself in the living out of the fruit of the Spirit. We studied that in Galatians 5, through 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. You know, as we commit to Christ and obey him, God guarantees that he will sanctify us. He will even come after those who wander away like a good shepherd. But if you lose your fear of him as judge, then you may wander away so far that you're no longer his lamb. Then the world, the flesh, and the devil have you. But if you suffer for the cause of Christ and stand in your commitment to him, you will be saved in the end. 1 Peter 4.19, so then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Hebrews 3.14, we have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly till the end the confidence we had at first. Paul goes on in verse 14, do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing. You know, now we get to the difficult part. If we're to be sanctified, we are to do everything without complaining or arguing. Oops, yikes. Guess what, folks? I'm still working on that. <laughs> are you? <laughs> now, there's a type of arguing, actually, that is right and good. Though to do so, we also need to take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. As seen in 2 Corinthians 10.5, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. That's the balance in doing apologetics, for instance. You know, we do argue for the truth, though we should not do so just to argue. We do so to demolish demonic arguments. You demolish arguments by arguing for the truth. But Paul's not addressing this in this verse to the Philippians. He's saying that as believers, part of our witness is being seen as people of integrity and wisdom that do not complain and argue all the time about unimportant issues. Paul says the Philippians live in a crooked generation. 
Hmm, what about us? I'd say that we live in the most crooked generation yet. Luke 17, 26, just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. I watch all the violence and stuff going on on TV and the perversion, and I just think to myself, this is why the Lord had to destroy the world and start all over again. And he'll end up having to do that, only he won't do it with water. He's going to do it with fire the next time. You know what? We need to stand for truth, integrity, purity, honor, and wisdom in a generation that's lost those things. You know, we were just talking earlier about, you know, being civil to people and helpful, you know, that we've lost a lot of that in our societies. We're supposed to live as salt and light before the world. Matthew 5, 13 through 16, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. You know, we can lose our saltiness by complaining and arguing amongst ourselves and in the world. I see a lot of that happen. We can hide the light of Christ in us when we are a poor witness to the world and act like the world does. How can we be effective witnesses? Well, by holding on to the word of life. Of course, Jesus Christ is the word, the word of life. His words are in the Bible. The Bible contains the words of life from God himself. We must hold on to our faith in Jesus Christ and to his word in order to be effective witnesses to this crooked generation. You know what? Unfortunately, that's where many churches have fallen down. They think that by becoming more like the world, they will be able to influence the world. False idea. The truth is that when we become true believers, we're set apart from the world. Paul said that he was set apart to preach the gospel. Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. Remember that set apart is the meaning of being a sanctified. We're not to become like the world to win the world, but we are to live a life in contrast, in opposition to the world in order to win the world. This is why so many people are saying they're Christians today, but few are actually born again. They, they evidence it by how they, they conduct themselves. So-called Christians who have not been set apart from the world are preaching a message that cannot save because they're not sanctified themselves. Paul is hopeful that he'll be able to boast about the Philippians, that they did not give up into the pressures of the world and unbelievers to become worldly. Philippians 2.17, but even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on, this, uh, on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Paul's life was being poured out. He literally gave his all for Christ. And the reason many Gentiles are saved today is because of the sacrifice of Paul and the other apostles. The reason the island people where I was sent to be a missionary are saved today is because of the sacrifice of missionaries who poured out their life as a drink offering to the Lord so that many could be saved. Paul rejoices that the Philippians are running the race with him and only need a gentle reminder and encouragement to keep going. You know, some saw Paul as a harsh man. They still do today. 
But you know what? When you read his letters, you see the love and concern he had for the churches he established. Those who stand for the truth are often mistaken as being harsh. But when you really look at the situation, you begin to realize they're actually the most loving and caring of all. When a school teacher urges you to do your homework and study better, is he or she being harsh? When a mother scolds her children for being disobedient, is she being harsh? Sometimes her attitude may be harsh, but the reason she does it is that she loves her children. When God rebukes us, we need to realize it is out of pure love that he's doing what he's doing. God wants us to rejoice with him when we suffer, yet come through it with a greater faith and the ability to help others in return. Mm -hmm.